into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of the Interverse podcast. And today we are kicking into gear with tourist season, talking about more herbalism and more folkloric, mystical, magical potentials with our relationship to the plants that have many virtues, but have perhaps been in other ways vilified. And that would, of course, be the poison plants that, as (laughs) many philosophers have said, actually, in the right dosage, every poison is actually a cure. We have today as our guests, uh, two for one combo. We got the Seed Sistas out of the UK. You can find their website at seedsistas.co.uk. That'll be linked in the show notes. And they were kind enough to send me a copy of their recent book, Poison Prescriptions, where they get into the power of plant medicine, magic and ritual in particular, as it pertains to the nightshade family of the aforementioned, somewhat demonized, uh, (laughs) but very powerful and very helpful plants. So we have so much we can get out into here, but these guys are, uh, their names are Fiona Heckles and Cass Goodweather. <laughs> and so welcome them to the show and check out their website where you can find a great deal of products in their shop and uh, apprenticeship offers, books and courses online. So much to learn, so much to get into. We're super excited for this one. How's it going, you two? Welcome to Interverse. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I know the time zone stuff over in the UK to here sometimes makes it a little tricky. It's one of the harder places to get lined up with, but we're here, we're ready to go. And I'd love to have some more of your story of who you two are, how you began working together and what drew you into this realm of uh, wisdom and witchcraft. Uh, yeah, well, we um, we met in the 2000s. Well, we met at the turn of the century in... London in North End of the Millennium. <laughs> End of the Millennium. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we like to call it the armpit of North London. <laughs> Ponder's End in a extremely um, clinical, medicalized degree in phytotherapy or herbal medicine. And we soon recognized a kindred spirit in one another because... The way that herbalism is taught or was taught back then was very much to attempt to bring herbalists into the medical sphere to be able to defend themselves and work alongside orthodox medicine. And yeah, we, I think we, we felt really blessed to have met each other because in this very, very clinical setting, there was bars on the windows of the treatment rooms. We were working in an old Victorian hospital in the clinic. And we always tell the tale of that you, you were only allowed one, maximum two colours in your hair, no facial jewellery. And most of the people that were on our course were there because of a deep love of gardening and plants and nature. And we arrived there and it felt so disconnected. But being wild, rebellious spirits that had already been completely connected to nature through our childhoods and into our teens and dancing in fields to repetitive beats and coming together in this place over this love of plants, we started working together 
and really naturally with this element of magic in everything that we were doing. So we'd be going out and making the tinctures, making the medicines, but infusing them with magic and quartz crystals that we'd collected in the mountains and just just playing and experimenting with the plants as well, really. Because it was just so medicalized, you know, we were in classrooms being taught herbalism through projectors and we weren't even going outside and just being given lists of chemical compounds that were in each plant and literally falling asleep on our desks. And it's a travesty that herbal medicine is made that boring. So when we when we burst out and came free of the course, um, we wanted to make herbalism accessible to everyone because here in the UK, very few people actually knew what a herbalist was. Many people don't know what a herbalist is even today. And when people ask us what we do and we say herbalist, the first idea here is that it's something to do with homeopathy because homeopathy is much more accepted. You can buy homeopathic remedies in every high street chemist. So people know what that is. And if that isn't the presumption, the other presumption is that you grow cannabis and you're a weed dealer if you're a herbalist. But people don't really know that medical herbalism is a thing, is a profession. So we set about trying to change that and to make herbalism as accessible and visible as we possibly could. I love it. Yeah, you're in good company here. And I like to, especially for new timers to the channel, to let you know that this is really like the black belt course. <laughs> Not that I'm a master herbalist myself per se, but the audience that we're reaching and sharing with today will be primarily rather than content consumers, independent researchers, gardeners, medicine makers themselves. So, you know, they are hungry for the really great gems of wisdom, but I want to hone in a little bit on what you're saying in regards to the training, how uh, my friend Kyle, who I have a, a long going series with on astro herbalism, where we talk about the virtues of plants as they are related to the current astrological season that the sun is in. Um, you know, last night he said something really profound when we were discussing Taurus about how, and, and it's a subject that comes up a lot, that a lot of herbalists are sort of trained in and shunted towards a type of green allopathy, where just as the chemical pharmaceuticals are designed to do to repress symptoms, a lot of herbalists are trained to operate in a similar way. And as that sinking ship continues to go under the waves, the you know, replacement for that will probably be funded by the same individuals that run the mafia on the current medical establishment in terms of having just on the corner all kinds of uh, products to, again, repress. But what we re really want is to express, express whatever uh, symptoms the body needs to work through and the feelings, emotions, beliefs, and all that that pertain to it. So can we talk a little bit more about how to uh, conceive the work with plants beyond the allopathic or repression model and into a more connected, uh, energetic, spiritual, emotional uh, avenue? Yeah. And that's, that's a reflection of the whole of current society, that there's a, um, an oppression that is oppressing expression. And we see that in any party we go to, any event we go to, there's a band that comes on, there's some brilliant music, and people here in this country are too inhibited to get up and dance without drinking alcohol first, which is our legal drug. And that's across the board. And herbalism, plants, hold keys many in many, many different ways to helping us unlock and let go of inhibitions to fully express ourselves. And one of our favourite plants for that is valerian. And when we were trained, we were taught in this way of what valerian does. And, you know, it's famed for being a relaxant, a sedative. But valerian, we soon discovered, especially when coupled with other herbs that are circulatory, can help us to let go of all inhibitions and really open up and circulate and express ourselves. 
and we developed a potion called Passion Potion. It was actually first called Dragon's Breath. That's valerian root and chili mixed with daisy, belly, bellis perenna. And the idea for the potion was to be able to go out on herbs and alter our consciousness without drinking alcohol or taking chemicals because we didn't want to take any chemicals anymore. And this, this kind of way of expressing ourselves through play, laughter, joy, connective creativity with other human beings in a party atmosphere really opened a doorway to loads of our other work. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention as well that we see the science as a way of giving a bit of a language to all of the other or seemingly other effects that the plants have. So we don't shun any of that by any means. We try to layer our experience and understanding of the herbs into this language that we learnt at university. And when we came out of university and all we had was complex words that you know, the lay person on the street that we were speaking to couldn't understand. We had to try and break it all apart and rebuild it into something that was more understandable, more visceral in terms of cooling, heating, warming, drying. And when we start talking like that, you you know, you are looking completely at the individual. And then we started tracing back at what was going on right back at the beginning of that symptomology. And oftentimes, you know, it can be stress, trauma, anxiety, prolonged stress, or it can also be societal that, you know, that people have experienced. And we started working with the herbs for specific experiences or specific pictures that people were showing. So like this lack of inhibition, specifically working with the valerian. And when you say valerian, people just think nighttime herbs, sedative. They don't think, what, open everything up, relax all the blood vessels, let the chili get to where it needs to go to heighten sensations. Um, You know, and when we started working with valerian like that, we were really blown away that if you just read about a plant in a book without really experiencing it, you can almost get a skewed version of what that plant's actually got on offer, the whole plethora, the broad range of it. And it really, it really opened us up to this everlasting world of knowledge that the plants have on offer. And we we always think that really getting to know and understand just a few plants really deeply is sometimes more important than having this vast materia medica of plants that you've never touched or seen grown or worked with in a deeper level. Very cool. Yeah, I'd never even thought about valerian being used that way. One thing that is fun for me and helps me kind of understand this stuff without maybe the experience of working with a lot of these plants directly outside of, you know, a valerian sleepy time, bedtime tea is to think about how they got their names and also some of the like root meanings and the names and the words. So what you were combining there with valerian and daisy, which has, so uh, I'm, I'm super into philology and etymology. So one thing that happens commonly between languages is the letter V and B get switched. So the valerian is also like Bali or belly. And, and so bell is like a name for the sun. It's a name for like intense energy gets associated with beauty and even war. And bell has that word in uh, the, you know, official name for Daisy, right? And yeah. a Daisy is the day's eye. When you look at it, it's got this solar signature of the sun and its rays coming off of it. Uh, so that combined with the Chile, which probably has a name that starts with cap, <laughs> you know, and the, the sun is kind of the top of our energetic pyramid as well. So when you're putting those things together, I, I really see just in the names how you're able to uh, 
open up channels of circulation of this vital force and what that vital force or that solar energy really brings, just like the daylight, the day's eye, brings us a heightened level of consciousness because we can see more. And on a, in a more subtle level, this is applying to all elements of consciousness when you're using it in a plant, not just the visible light that you're able to see things with. I think that's so cool. <laughs> and uh, basically, I guess where the question is in that is how how the mythology and the naming of plants have this tradition that has been not fully lost, but needs to be kept and passed forward of the wisdom and the, the virtues of these plants being accessible through the stories and through the names in ways beyond needing a textbook to tell you what it is. Yeah, we've actually um, been at a, a panel today that's all about how the healing power of story and specifically connected with herbs. And it was really interesting to see different people's interpretations of that because the work that we've done with the names of plants, we, we really believe in, in reviving and creating modern folklore that connects with the plants that can then be passed on generationally so that we're really thinking about engaging everyone in in terms of their own society and culture that they can understand these stories so we actually work with the plants we create characters for them we tell stories sometimes dressed as the plants and interact with each other and and do performance art that can then be absorbed back into that kind of oral tradition and that really visceral way of absorbing knowledge and information. And um, it's been really amazing to see how, how transformational that can be. It's like, it's like trying to tell someone, I don't know, you've had an amazing experience out in a field with mushrooms or something and no one really needs to know what your experience was. But if you put that experience into a story with a moral or a fiber, or then it has so much more meaning to people. And it's the same with the work with the plants, that if you can put them into stories and pass on those messages in that way, even that dragon's breath, the passion potion, it has a whole story that connects and goes along with it that brings all of those herbs into it. And that's been one really interesting way of working with stories with the herbs. And we've got the Greek myth. We've got all of those wonderful gods and goddesses that many of the plants are named for or the stories, um, like with the marshmallow, the goddess of healing Althea has become her Latin name. So each of the plants have Latin binomial, two names, a, a name for the genus and a name for the species. And Althea, this goddess of healing, is soft and soothing and kind and caring and the archetypal old school nurse that tucks you in and puts a bit of damp cloth on your brow when you're fevering. And we can see her archetype live through the marshmallow. As we work with mugwort, we bring Artemis, the goddess of the moon, with her duality and her huntress energy into all of the work and story that we read. With Yarrow, we've got the great warrior Achilles. So there's, there's layers and layers. You brought in astro herbalism as well. We've got um, a wealth of work. We love Nicholas Culpepper's book and, and all of the future kind of astro herbalists that have come forth. And you can create your own mythology and folklore and you can create your own art as we've used herbs to dye things, make our own jewellery and things like elder beads. There's just a world of play to have with the plants. And what we like to do is inspire people that we're working with to find their own way in. So whatever their own personal attraction to being creative is, there's always a way in with herbalism. And those sort of just to add to that, those stories can really help to layer that science back in as well. So you've got within the Althea all of those 
soothing polysaccharides that create that kind of mucilaginous coating and soft and soothing for the lungs and the digestive system. And with the Achilles, the, um, the yarrow, you've got those blue essential oils, those azulines, which have that real protection for the herb from disease and um, stopping them being eaten fungal infections which also act in our body in the same way to to help prevent and support against infections taking root and setting in so you have also within the stories the the science reflected in that with the constituents and the compounds and how they act in a physical way on the body as well as in a more spiritual or emotional way as well that's totally my favorite part of all of this is how the mythology ties in. And I think it's long been a, a tradition, you know, even anatomy, but parts of the body internally have names relating to mythology as well. It's been a component of our capacity to know and to remember for a long time. But then at some point, society had made this shift towards an authoritative experience of uh, nature, reality, truth, where it needs to come from the expert to know rather than our, you know, connecting to our innate capacity to know. And so, you know, with that, you guys seem like you're pretty much reviving the modern bardic tradition in a way, which I really love. And part of what, in my understanding of the Druids, part of their system was that they didn't really want to commit any of their uh, deep truths or wisdoms to writing. Because they wanted people to be able to, in their initiates, to be able to express the power of memory and strengthen the power of their memory. So also, you know, outside of the modern authority-based culture, there was a common practice of creating your own story to remember what it is that needed to be remembered. I love that. And whenever we take that component away and it's just sort of dry memorization <laughs> and a one-size-fits-all approach, it really does separate us from the essence of all this, which is that it should be fun, actually. <laughs> so uh, it sounds like you guys have fun with it. And I would love maybe an example of a story around a plant that you've crafted to help impart the wisdom and virtue of it. It, it doesn't even have to be just one. I, I like this a lot. <laughs> and today I've embodied rose. So Rosa Canina is our native wild dog rose. And she lives out in the hedgerow. And we call her Rosa Hearts Petal because her petals are perfect hearts. And she has this ability to soothe and cool our hearts. And she's a grandmother midwife. She's one of those midwives that sits in a rocking chair doing her knitting while someone is laboring. And she's just quite happy to sit back and let it all happen. And knows at the moment when she's needed to come into action. And she is a character who, when you're sad and you need a little bit of a pet me up, she'll take you in to her great big enormous bosom and hold you and stroke your head. But as soon as you start getting a bit self-indulgent or wallowing, she'll give you a bit of a sharp slap and say, come on, get, get with the process and not let you just fall and spiral down. It's She's, like that tone and quality that the whole Rose family has. It's like getting you in shape. <laughs> getting you in shape, the astringency through the tannins. And th this character with the softest, most delicate, beautiful petals that don't last for very long has these incredibly sharp, hardcore barbs of the thorns. And it's this, um, the complexity of being feminine, a herb of Venus, and soft, and receptive, and strong, and protective, um, what some people call masculine. And she also embodies the, um, the conversation that we're having in this century about gender dynamics, and what it means, why we label things feminine or masculine, and what that actually means, really. So she's given us a whole way into talking to non-binary people who we're surrounded with. We've got teenagers in that world and looking at plants through a lens of 
non-gender, which is something that's really changed and shifted in our 20 odd years of practice and work together. You know, we do call plants he or she, and we've started to look at what we think of or what we've labelled masculine qualities or feminine qualities as something else. She, uh, she has a, she does that. Rose doesn't know it, but she's having a, a battle with one of her sisters who also lives in the hedgerow, the bramble, who just feels like she's always there, always picked and seen by everyone, but is completely overlooked for the more worshipped and demure Rose. And she's your kind of, Common as much. She's a Geordie. She's from the northeast of England, and uh, she she invites you in for a cup of tea and sticks the kettle on, and she'll be there to listen to all your worries and your problems, and she won't ask for anything in return. Her door's always open, and she's there with her berries to completely nourish and provide and support, even though everyone wants to chop her back all the time. She's like, "Look, I'm not going anywhere. You might not think you need me now, but you need me," and she's really representative of the the access to what have been deemed superfoods that are flown in from all over the globe to go in people's smoothies and drinks in the morning. And she's really representative of what's growing right on your doorstep that has provided so much kind of joy all all over for families throughout the centuries, but is is almost forgotten about as this really powerful, amazing medicine. And also from that Rose family with this binding, supportive quality. And we always talk about the hedgerow being like this whole brother and sisterhood, this resistive resistance that that's impenetrable when they're all together with their arms together there with this full nourishment in the autumn time but also this impenetrable force that you can't get through and what that hedgerow really represents in terms of the energy that we're all needing to find to move through these incredibly challenging and difficult times at the minute and that we really need to come together like that and support each other yeah and we've um we've played with others in that same family so the apple um we've got a lot of different apple trees here and we've got orchards surrounding us and apple um malus domesticus um it's domesticated evil is what her latin name translates so so domesticated evil when i embody apple she's got a chip on her shoulder she's a little bit paranoid because people are labeling her as the root cause of the demise of humanity you know, we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden because Eve ate the apple. So there's a lot of angst. And thank goodness that her cousin Damson <laughs> gives her a bit of slow gin. They're just actually a pair of lushes because, you know, apple gets turned into cider and Damson's like your, your posher version of your slow gin. And Damson's have been one of the first cultivated fruits, actually, that were were brought from Damascus and travelled all around the world. And uh, together they just sort of put the worlds to right, getting sozzled and um, having a really good time. (laughs) (laughs) And we've been touring recently as the Solanaceae sisters and I've been Carolina Reaper Sol, the hottest damn chilli in the whole motherfucking world. And I'm a narcissist and it's all about me. And I am manifesting whatever I want, the Church of Chile, my red Ferrari, while the Chura Moonflower is trying to keep it on track. <laughs> yeah, she's got a plan to uh, get all of you human kin back connected with the plant world. And uh, she's she's also on board of trying to coax Carolina around because Carolina Reaper, the hottest chili, is so loved by so many people the world over. Hundreds of thousands of tons of chili are grown every year and Datura knows that she needs her on side. So Davina Datura is continuously trying to nurture her ego, Carolina's ego, but bring her back around to the point, which is like, let's get with the program. Let's plant community gardens. Let's all get together. And um, 
yeah, because Davina de Tura, while she's demure and beautiful and sensual and she knows she's just not as well known as Chile. So she's trying to shift the balance a little bit back to what's important. I'm definitely starting to get the picture of how you guys operate. Like they're, you know, you're mythologizing of these uh, other beings is that they're your friends and you've anthropomorphized them, which is such a cool way to feel connected to them. And uh, I just really like that. Uh, it's a super cool approach. And, you know, I, I want to talk about Datura more, but can we just discuss from some length the uh, the nature of earth magic uh, from your perspective, how the magic comes into the equation uh, beyond just the chemistry of what these plants hold as compounds? Yeah. So the earth magic, the it all comes down to vibes. And the earth's vibrating. We all, well, we know the earth's got a vibration, a pulse. Um, there's a sound so low we probably isn't detectable. I don't know. I haven't got the machine, but I can hear the earth. I can feel the earth. One of my favorite uh, tools is a tuning fork. There's a weighted fork that's the Schumann resonance you're talking about times 12. And it is an incredible healer <laughs> to just get into that vibration. Yeah. But. I don't have the language of vibrational medicine, the uh, the technical language, but I feel the pulse and the vibration of the earth. I feel the individual vibrations of everything in nature and everything live. We talk about our hearts resonating um, an electromagnetic field around us and everything has this pulse and energy. So we follow that vibration and we don't always have um, a structure of a plan. We let our magic flow through us and unfold. Somebody once told us that what we do is an emergent tradition. And so that's what we do. <laughs> We've been told we make it up as we go along and go with what feels good to us. Anyway. We, we used to call it magic on the hoof, but our, uh, our, our lovely friend said, what are you doing is an emergent tradition. We were like, oh, okay. I mean, this is many years ago. <laughs> like, okay. Because it's uh, when you're out in nature, you don't necessarily have a purple candle or a, a red scarf or whatever someone might have written down in a book that's what you need for that particular ritual or work that you're doing. and. Actually, it's about this reciprocity, this give and take between the plants and sitting there and being like, okay, what what does this wild space need? What does this plant require? What am I asking of this plant? And sitting there and being with it. And some of our most profound experiences with the plants have been just completely unbridled wildness up in the mountains or the hills together might have been swimming naked in waterfalls and then going and harvesting heather. Um, one time we had an amazing experience with the heather where, um, well, actually many amazing experiences with the heather. We were working with heather around that period of time. But there's one particular time we, it was back when cameras were separate from your telephones. So we had a camera and on this whole hillside of heather, we lost the camera somewhere. We were like, oh, okay. And we just started like a up and down, up and down to try and find the camera. And after about an hour, we were just like, this, this mathematical technique is not working. Like we must be able to connect in here in a different way. And we just had this real sense of Heather that she's this like purple rinse bobbing wise old hilarious lady that likes to crack a joke and that if you just are there to connect in with her and crack a joke with her she'll offer you these pearls of wisdom and there's all of this connection with the third eye and inner wisdom with heather and we were just like okay heather like help us out here this would be really useful to have back and in that moment we just looked down and there poking out of one of the bunches of heather with the camera right at our feet and we're just like 
oh, thank you, Heather. And just that moment of connecting in with her. And, you know, sometimes it's just about taking the time to stop and feel the magic of the natural world rather than just walking through it like it's pretty wallpaper. And we've found that the magic has just opened up to us from that spending time really in whatever guises that's been with the plants and in nature. This is really cool. So I'm going to summarize what you guys have said and repeat it back to you and see what you think, because it is so in alignment with how I also feel. And that would be universe boils down to vibration and energy. So everything else is sort of an expansion or expression of that, meaning the only thing we have any control over is our vibe, right? (laughs) So in terms of how you're approaching magic, it's kind of twofold. It's one, doing and acting in the way that will help you maintain the vibe that you want. So for example, to just sort of stay in the fun zone (laughs) with things. And then that vibe that you're holding is also going to then be what influences the things that happen around you. And so it's not like you have to do everything right by the book, by some ancient grimoire to manifest the result that you want. In fact, that's almost like in some ways, not that you should never do that or it's like wrong, but it can, when obsessively done, maybe constitute a lack of trust, perhaps, that you're trying to control too much. Um, Aligning different things that do have resonance together does accentuate the feeling of fun and the play of it. So it is, there, there's an element of that, but it's really about maintaining the feeling that you want, creating the feeling that you want, and magic being how that change of consciousness changes the external world in some way too. And then the other component that is super important that you elucidated would be that nature and the world around us is not <laughs> pretty wallpaper, as you said, that you could have a communicative relationship to it, that you could see it as it sees you and that there's an exchange at all times and that nothing is truly dead or inert. Is that sounding right? Yeah, that sounds great. And that exchange with nature can, um, we use our voices, we speak out loud to the plants, we sing or chant out loud, which creates its own vibration. You know, someone once asked, why do you speak out loud? What does the plant feel? And you know, the plant feels the resonance of our voice, of our voice box of music that's brought to the plant. So that's a really important exchange within it all. Yeah, and the more, you know, we're, we're being slightly glib about magic on the hoof and just using what's around you. and But there is also that the more thought and care and attention and intention that you put into everything that you do, the more power that's added to that through that care and attention and time that's taken. It's just that that care and attention and time doesn't necessarily have to be dictated to by somebody else, although, like you alluded to, sometimes having a framework can be helpful when people are really uncertain and aren't used to being able to trust in their own ability to create magic. That sometimes a basic structure of how to enter into communication with the plants and with nature and with magic can be a really helpful container to enter into that world. And then when you feel more confident within that and you see shifts occurring and how your life can be enhanced through so-called magical practices, in our words, connecting with nature, that then you can become more confident to really guide your own way through in f- in the future. So we do offer we do offer a framework to people that want to enter into communication with plants. Um, we do offer that as well because we get it. We you know we we are not all blessed to have been brought up with nature in the same way and that we want to make it accessible to absolutely everybody yeah we, we when we began people were asking us you know when we began teaching we didn't 
offer frameworks. We offered chaos. <laughs> People kept going, where are the handouts? What do you mean? How, how much of that? How, how do you weigh it? What's the measurement? And we were like, no, you just make it up. And people couldn't handle it. But we learned that through the years because we come from, we come from punk. You know, we were born out of DIY culture, living on the road, may, literally making it up as we were going along with a community of people doing that. So you have to unlearn a certain amount of what you know when you communicate with a wide range of different people. People wanted certificates. Now, at the beginning, the idea of certification is abhorrent. Well, it still is, actually. It's abhorrent to me, but people want certificates. They want bits of paper. They think that they're beautiful. I can see that aspect, but it's not for me. I don't want any certificate. So I'd still feel weird about giving people certificates, but I know they want them. We made them beautiful, didn't we? we? We put daisies on the first certificate and we put Hawthorne on the second certificate. So we're like, here's the baby certificate. Here's the grown up certificate. <laughs> like they, yeah, it was, it's, it's good. People want different. Well, then you've got the magic of the herb on your wall if you put it there. You know, that's what's infusing the joy of Daisy, the courage of Hawthorne that, you know, um, so yeah. <laughs> the paradox you want to smash the system but you've got to play in the system uh. <laughs> right and it's the uh, the eternal struggle of incarnate existence the individual and the collective clashing but the you know the real good life is kind of somewhere in the middle where you don't just bow to every whim of the collective but you know you throw them a bone <laughs> while you're still doing your own thing i love it and uh, the make it up as you go thing that is I remember how important the epiphany was for me when I branched off into my own uh, healing practice and uh, vibrational healing is kind of what I would categorize what I do. I use tuning forks to find stuck energy in people's uh, aura. And then the fascinating thing about that is you can actually tell them how old they were and what kind of experience or trauma they had based on where you find the stuck energy. So it's kind of like a, a psychic party trick <laughs> that helps them get the belief of like, wow, there's really something happening here. But for me, whenever I started going in that direction and, and working with people, the uh, fear of not having the certificate or not being trained, <laughs> you know, that, that was definitely a part of it. But then realizing that being connected with source or God or nature, whatever the creative, dynamic, self-existing, intelligent, ordering principle that is our life force energy, whatever we call it, that being in and flow with that, it feels like you're making things up as you go. And that makes perfect sense because that's the creator. You know, if you are the creator or the creator works through you, however you want to conceptualize it, while well, a creator makes it up. <laughs> so there's this sort of a uh, crossing of a threshold where you no longer feel inauthentic because you're making it up, but instead the making it up is what makes it authentic, you know? Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a little layer to that as well that's um, that's back to the individual coming because um, we what we've seen also is that people are very fearful to um, express if they're not comfortable to ask questions and we always say to people if you ever find yourself in a situation where there's something you want to know but you don't feel comfortable enough to ask it then it's probably not the right situation and it's almost taking it back to the individual to be discerning with where they want to be who and what they're trusting in and if we don't have that because we've been brought up in a society where you have to be um subservient or um there's there's hierarchies of of knowledge understanding and who you should look up to then you you hand your power over and that's where you get the situation where certification shows that that person's done this and that person hasn't because you don't have that personal discernment to feel confident enough to ask those questions so we always try and bring it back to people and say how do you feel about the relationship that you're entering into with this person? And do you feel confident enough to, if you're confused or concerned, to ask questions and have that confusion and concern allayed, you know? So 
it's all back to us being self-responsible and for ourselves, which is not a culture of litigation and insurance and all the rest of it. I mean, insurance is another one, is it, Cass, that we've battled with for years. We, we, you know, we have it because events want it and people want it, but we're like, you know, this is your health. It's not our responsibility. It's your responsibility. We're here to support you in finding your journey to health. And Nature doesn't sell insurance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole industry is predicated on selling you something fake. It's so funny. Yeah, and on certificates, you know, it's like, yeah, it's all tied into the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, cool. So let's talk a little bit about what people could uh, connect with you guys to learn. Courses, apprenticeship, uh, the books you've written. Can we touch on some of that stuff and what they might find if they visit your website and what you're excited about? We're, we're especially excited at the moment about our new work, our new book that's come out. It's not new work, it's old work, but The Poison Prescription to us is a spell. We've written a spell, the book is a spell, and it is about the connection of magic and medicine. And the fact that the two are really inseparable. And as medicine women who've drawn on magic forever, these plants have given us the opportunity to completely shift and alter our consciousness and welcome in a new, it feels like a new dawning because these plants, the Solanaceae, the Datura, Belladonna, and Henbane in particular, that we focused on within the book have seen a resurgence. And we and I have been working with these plants together for the last 20 years. And they dropped out of fashion and use because of certain legislations. But now there seems to be a global revival. And we've seen that because we were just taking part in a conference, Botanica Obscura, where People from all over came forth and shared their love of poisons and poisonous medicine. And that word poison, when you go into the etymology of poison, poison is potion because potion and medicine, poison is, is a curative agent. It's all about dose. And these plants are incredible medicines for a variety of different physiological illnesses and have been used throughout time to heal and help people as well as kill. It's, it's taken us quite a long time to put this work out there because um, we, we didn't want to alienate anyone from our work. The, the whole We run a community interest company, it's a social enterprise. So all of the profits are about putting money back into access to education, to herbal education. And we set up that organization realizing that very few people out there in the world knew about herbal medicine. And we went to a really inspiring talk by someone that set up the campaign Surfers Against Sewage, which was to get sewage off our beaches in here in the UK and sanitary towels and all the rest of it. And it was a, an amazing campaign that went global and was extremely influential in cleaning up the UK beaches. And Chris Hines, the instigator of that, he said to us, if you've got a campaign, you need to not alienate anyone from it. And at the time we were called Witch Theatre. We had bones hanging from outside our 1960s airstream and a big cauldron out of the front. And we had all of our remedies and herbs and our serious medical herbalism beyond that. But people had to walk into this display of like, you know, pure witch archetype to, to come and see beyond that. And we were deliberately doing that to filter out anyone that felt that they wanted to challenge fundamentally who we were because when we were coming out there as medical herbalists people wanted us to prove what we were doing and we had papers that were published and but we got tired of that 
So we were reborn as the Seed Sisters. That's a whole other story in itself because everyone can connect in with seed and food and nourishment. And so our first work, the Sensory Herbal Handbook, was about getting back to basics with connecting with plants, with herbs. Um, there is actually a section on detour in there, which we we sneak that in. We were like, this is our really straight book, but we're going <laughs> to we'll put a whole section on detour in there at the back. And um, and then the more the more visible our work has become and the more people have got behind it, the more we've been able to step back into this work of saying these poisons, the Solanaceae, really represent the remerging of magic and medicine, that medical herbalism and magical practice don't have to be two completely separate entities that we can bring them back together and those plants really represent that because they've been so maligned, like like the word witch, like the ma- like magical practice. But they're so powerful, and you know, even within allopathic medicine, still used today, and within medical herbalism for asthma and Parkinson's, and in this physiological way. So they've got this amazing bridge that they're they're. They are. They are the bridge, really. And they've also been um, part of the story of witches flying on broomsticks and the whole witches flying ointment is made up in a large part from these Solanacea herbs and others that grow alongside them in the witch's garden. And that's been um, an incredible part of our work because it connects with so much of sacred sexuality, which we didn't know what kind of a a Pandora's box of chaos that would open when we started to explore shame around our own bodies, around being a woman, around the word cunt, which is the most shocking word in the English language here in the UK, but it's the only word that describes the whole of our anatomy and is a sacred word. And because this flying ointment is a wanking lube, a hallucinogenic lube that should be in common practice and should, funny word, can be, could be in common practice and for everyone. And why not? So they, these questions that resonate really deeply with us and we've watched the rippling effect over the, the decades of how they resonate with others um, has just opened something that we don't even know what it's opened. We're just riding the wave of chaos. And I'm sure um, that, that also brings us back to we've, We've been putting out these works have taken us a long time to produce and publish and get out there. Um, and we've got a set of oracle cards on the way as well that are each one has got the stories of each plant contained within them. And they what what we find is that people are continuously saying to us, What's next? What can I learn now? What's what you know, more, more, more. We're like, ah, <laughs> But so what we're really excited as well about is something we've got upcoming, which isn't out yet, but is called the Coven of Herbal Secrets. And it's our members area that's soon to soon to be launched where we can really respond to people's needs and what they want within that. And they get access to live webinars and lots of other fun content that we'll be producing and behind the scenes stuff as well. But um, where we can really start to form this worldwide community um, in a much more connected way. So we're really excited about about bringing everything together in this kind of, yeah, it's not online tech coven. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what the pandemic did to us. The pandemic forced us onto, onto the screen and it's been really interesting responding to what people have been asking for and creating webinars where we can talk for 90 minutes about a subject that people vote on and then take people's questions 
and it's it's been quite humbling actually because you know you're given we give people a set of subjects and they say oh we want that subject and then we go away and see what we can produce and create and because of that we're constantly learning and I think it's a real privilege to be a so-called teacher because for both of us we're perfectionists and we want to do it right and we want to fully understand what we're imparting and sharing and yeah we do make up our magic and go with the flow but we're very serious about our herbalism and the way that we share our knowledge and it's been great just going back into the garden and creating a new load of potions and going back to the books because I love a good herbal, especially the old history ones and going and looking at the cutting edge science and listening to what people are saying on the subject. So we're constantly learning and updating and growing. Um, but we are so, at <laughs> so much changes in this world, the herb world all the time. We're really open to recorrecting wrongs or mistakes that we've made that we, you know, are we're recognised from the way we've been taught or from traditions and where things have come from. And we're continuously checking ourselves and being open to criticism and, you know, a, a space like that that's really dynamic gives us that capacity to be really accountable for everything that we put out there. And, um, yeah, so it's, that's exciting too. So cool. Yeah, awesome. The shift to more online stuff is blessing in a lot of ways even though it was maybe hard to go there <laughs> but it's cool that you guys are sharing like that and a uh, really fun phase that it seems like you're in in your your teaching career so I love that um have you guys ever heard of the hindu character from the mahabharata kunti mm. okay cool yeah just yeah. for the audience out there that's a possible origin of that particular word and she's one of the five maidens of the hindu tradition whose very name is believed to dispel sin when recited. So, you know, it's kind of a, a big, it, it reminds me of the way like the, the violet plant has associations in Christianity with like virginity and purity. But then in like the Greek mythos, it, it, it's associated with like Aphrodite and Priapus, the giant phallus god. <laughs> and uh, so it's like which tradition you go to the, the meaning kind of shifts, but it's always coming back to the power in that generative principle and whether or not a culture is uh, harnessing that power through repression or through expression. Yeah, and that's what they did that with Artemisia as well. You know, she she wouldn't be tied down to to marriage or wed to one person. So they started associating her with chastity and she wasn't about chastity at all. She was about wild expression and freedom and not being tied down. but. They had to put it in a nice little palatable box at the time, you know, depending on which society is reading into the stories. And that's something we've got to be really aware of as well, you know, going through is where the where the stories come from and through whose eyes we're being told those stories. And uh, Uma, Uma Dinsmore is a, a yoga teacher of ours. He's written a book called Yoni Shakti and she wanted to call it Cunt Power, but they... Uh, the publisher wouldn't let her, so she ended up calling it Yoni Shakti, Kunt Power. And uh, she talks a lot about the origins of the word cunt and the, the, you know, this this power that's held within that word and how demonized it's, how the story's turned, how the story's changed. Well, in our last couple of minutes before we take our break between the hours, I'd love for you to remind everybody where they can find your stuff and maybe throw out there a product that you particularly like that maybe is kind of like a well-kept secret <laughs> on your sh uh, shop. <laughs> well, it's not on the shop if it's a well-kept secret, but you can write to us and find out. Um, so seedsisters.co.uk, we actually, we have a, a bit of a free download signy uppy to our newsletter, which we link every week to um, blogs that we write, to recipes, 
keep people up to date with what we're up to. We put loads and loads of free content out there. We've got an amazing blog on our website as well. Um, but signing up to the newsletters really gives you that opportunity to engage with us. Let us know what you want to see produced. Um, and we've got another cool thing as well that actually I don't know, maybe we can share the link with you afterwards that's for a little fun um, find your power herb. Um, so you put in your, your sun sign, your astrology, and then you get pinged over a bit of blurb about a, a power herb for you to work with for this month or this, this period of time. Um, so we can we that. Well, we've got a load of um, like e-guides we've created. So we've tried to create seasonal e-guides. That's what we did at the pandemic. We were like, right, what can we do? <laughs> What can we make that's in a bit of an online product that doesn't involve packaging it up and posting it all around the world? Because we're not very keen on posting posting herbs out. But we have made a spring and a summer fire guide, an autumn guide and a winter guide to some of our favorite recipes and herbal derbles that are around at that time of year. And our new cleanse guide, our 21 day cleanse guide, that's been really amazing. We've developed a three week cleanse where the first week's about, I mean, all the way through you're introducing different herbs and juices and, you know, principles to practice physically. But in the first week, you're really focusing on clearing your space um, and energetically. And the second week, you focus in a lot more on yourself and where you choose to put your energy and in the third week it's a lot about looking forward at how you're going to take the cleanse on into your life and setting affirmation for the future um and it's it, we we embarked on it we we developed it and then we embarked on it this season just before we put it out and it was really it was really exciting and really amazing to have a cleanse that incorporates thinking about your environment in it as well uh, that's up there too. Uh, as you say over there, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. What a fun first hour, y'all. Thank you so much. And um, we'll take our short break here. And on the other side, dive into more of the devil in the details with these poison prescriptions. Looking forward to that quite a bit. So thank you so much. Encourage everyone to go check out their website and uh, get into the learning. I know this audience loves this topic. So appreciate your time. Hey, everybody, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with the Seed Sisters. I definitely loved getting to meet them. Kaz and Fee. What cool names, by the way. Kaz Goodweather. Fiona. Heckles. <laughs> they were so much fun, and it was very cool to see how our personal philosophies overlapped, and maybe even more than they realized, but you guys here in the audience, especially the ones of you who have been around for quite a while are, I'm sure, having a little dance in your seat thinking, what a fun conversation, what a treat. I particularly appreciate whenever we can connect with somebody overseas where there's a big potential for new kind of cross-pollination. So if you guys out there are, haven't ever heard Interverse before, new to me, welcome to the channel. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation with the sisters who presumably you're fans of. And if you did, please, I invite you to go check out the archives of our channel here and see what kind of things might catch your interest, particularly the topics of holistic health and energy healing, even herbalism are things that we've gone into in depth in the past. I totally encourage you to check out the Astro Herbalism series with Kyle Denton and Michelle Lundquist. We are seven deep currently. And we're working our way up to 12 months of the year where we're covering the doctrine of signatures, the wisdom encoded in the different qualities of plants and herbs that are able to teach us through the also astrological connections, what kind of things they might be virtuous for. A really fun series. I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, also, um, if you're new to the channel, there's a lot of ways you can support and get something good in return. 
of particular interest, it might be to check out Tippica New Herbs linked in the show notes, as well as everything I might bring up. It's going to be linked in the episode description. Tippica New Herbs, my good buddy, Kyle Denton, who I just mentioned, he's got an incredible, powerful skill set with his potion making and his teaching about how these plants speak to us. I personally love quite a few of the products on their store. Really good tinctures. <laughs> I power through long podcasts with the gladder bladder tincture right here. And I've got quite a few others uh, on deck. So if you're looking to upgrade your tincture arsenal, check out Tippica New Herbs and put in the Innerverse coupon code for 10% off. And that supports me a bit as well. Very, very appreciated. And if you enjoyed the first hour of this conversation, but you didn't hear us get into hour two, hour two is where we really get into the, the deep part of the talk, especially in uh, how it pertains to the Poison Prescriptions book, which by the way, if you like this type of stuff, this type of stuff, if you like herbs and, and learning about how they relate mythologically, linguistically, historically, and not just, you know, sort of the clinical allopathic chemical compound based description of learning, you know, fact memorization, you want to learn through story instead. And you want to see beautiful imagery and illustrations. Like I'm just holding up a random page of this book, but most of the pages of the book are illustrated in color. So it's a really nice book. I do hope you guys check it out. Seedsisters.co.uk. I think I got that right. Let me make sure. Yeah. Seedsisters.co.uk. Check them out. And they've got a lot of products as well, but the book is for sure a good place to start. Now, if you want to hear hour two, you can get on my Patreon for five bucks a month or rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash interverse where you'll be able to subscribe there to uh, basically the Netflix of indie creators, get access to a whole bunch of premium content across the network that in most cases you actually won't be able to find elsewhere because of censorship on the more mainstream platforms, driving people like myself over to these great independent companies that are paying us and helping us to support us in our work. Very, very appreciated. And in the second hour, the specific topics that we cover would be some of the history of poisons and poisoners, anesthetics and the mysteries of consciousness, qualities and like the uh, the range of where Detura lives. Qualities of Detura, I mean, that was a big can of Detura right there. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Discussed henbane and uh, how it may be related to the crossing of the end of life barrier and, you know, the river sticks, if you will. A really fun weave into the alcohol or the beer purity laws passed by the church back in the day where hensbane and mugwort and other medicinal herbs were illegalized and hops were made mandatory to put into your brew. So much to say about all that and the why and the, the consequences. <laughs> And we we talked about raving, you know, raving with uh, Belladonna and Dionysus. Mugwort, again, as a uh, protecting spirit and a gateway plant. I really like that. And the sisters told us about their powerful witch's flying ointment. And we rounded out the talk with a little chat about malevolent magic, curses, hexes, jinxes, and how to, instead of directing malintent, towards men and women to instead consider that the possibility of these disintegrative and destructive intentional projections could be put towards institutional corruption and uh, more uh, the word would be like you know not not embodied non-living things uh, really like attacking the fiction with the real I like that a lot Basically, it kind of comes down to the philosophy notion of you attack the idea, not the man. And the karma for that isn't going to mirror rebound back into your face and blow up your oven in the middle of the day. <laughs> so, so much there, more than I stated, but those are some of the highlights of the plus extension. Very valuable second hour. Hope you guys dig in. And of course, if you just buy the poison prescriptions book, you'll probably get more out of it than the conversation. So it's not like I'm trying to gatekeep you from wisdom 
But I do appreciate the channel of reciprocity where supporting through getting access to the extensions means you're also helping keep me going here. And, you know, this is my job. This is my career, if you will. <laughs> More like it's what I would do anyway. And it's the total love of my life. But I do appreciate also being able to eat through it. <laughs> uh, so you can also, man, there's a, yeah. what, else, what else do I want to say about all these topics that we got into today? Gosh. You know, I think that the episode speaks for itself. I'm not going to be too long in the tooth in the outro, but I do also have services that you might be interested in, in the biofield tuning work that uh, I do plenty of interviews on. So if you want to check out interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing, you will be able to find some videos where I teach it and talk about the method. But essentially, in a nutshell, if you're somebody out there looking for a more subtle way to empower yourself without the need for side effects and toxic medicines, you want to actually get to the root cause of disorder and dissonance in the body and express rather than repress. Tuning might be the thing for you. Um, using the knowledge of the biofield anatomy, we can find stuck energy in your aura and help you see what it's relating to and what patterns have been created out of your beliefs and expectations about yourself and about life in order to upgrade your awareness and help you expand, which is really what you're here for. So hopefully, you know, me and Fiona and uh, Kaz can work together sometime in the future. I'd love to stay in touch and see if they put out some more work that we can talk about. They were a lot of fun. Definitely a unique conversation. And I hope you guys are having a great day out there or night or wherever this finds you, past, present, or future. I'll go ahead and get off of here, but take care out there. Much love. Join our Telegram channel, t.me. Uh, slash interverse podcast, I think, or interverse chat. Ah, I better find out. Okay. Telegram is where you go to connect with the tribe. And yeah, it's t.me slash interverse podcast chat. Replace your Google searching with human interaction. You know, get some wisdom from our peers and our fellow community. And after that, yeah, good night. Good luck. Much love. Talk to you guys next time. 